When I was a kid, my parents had a console stereo system the size of a whale. It had tone controls on it, bass and treble, and I futzed with them endlessly. That was my introduction to EQ. It's a little different with live sound systems. I'm Paul. Today, let's talk about EQ. In live sound reinforcement, EQ is one of your most fundamental tools. You could think of an EQ as a frequency specific volume control, uh, where you can either boost or cut a frequency, uh, and that's a tremendously powerful way to manipulate that signal. There's sort of two categories I think of uh, for EQing, and one category is problem solving. You're, you're working on room modes or eliminating feedback, and the other sort of category of EQ use is uh, tone control for an instru individual instrument or vocalist. If you need to warm it up or, or, or brighten the, the, the top end of it, uh, you can use EQ for this tone control. And so you have these two dueling um, twin purposes for using EQ and what you're working on. Now there are three places you might EQ things within a sound system and they each serve a different purpose. So I'm thinking in terms of strategy with EQ, how you accomplish what you need to. Uh, the furthest from the soundboard is where we're going to start, with the system processor. In this particular sound system, we're using a Yamaha DME as the system processor. Uh, many other brands exist. Within this system processor, it inherently takes care of EQing the speakers themselves. Things like doing the low pass that goes to the subwoofers and some of the other uh, shading and the brightness to make sure that the further throw cabinets and the near throw cabinets sound uh, appropriate for their usage and, and e evenly in balance. So the furthest level of EQ out is to make the boxes sound their best. Uh, another possible use for this is for instance with our under balcony speakers that are little guys, you, you roll off the low end, you, so you sort of EQ that out with a low shelf or low cut, and uh, then you let the amplifier and the speakers work within their most efficient range and let them do what they're supposed to do. So there's these practical applications for that furthest out EQ. Now there's one that's between the sound system and the soundboard or on the main outputs or main matrix outputs of the soundboard and this EQ is to tune the sound system to the room. So if we've used the system processor to make the boxes sound right, now we're going to work on EQ that addresses room modes and the room tone and uh, takes a, uh, into account all of the considerations about the speaker placement and, and everything else it takes to make the sound system sound the way you need it to and work properly. The reason we're putting those EQs in those places is because when we get to the channel strip EQ, this is the third area, and the EQ that's on each individual channel strip is something that we want to leave available for tone control for the individual instruments, vocals, whatever it is that are on those channels. So we're trying to do the practical EQ further upstream, and then when you're looking at the mixing board, the EQ associated with a, with an individual input, well those, those EQ bands of EQ, they're not um, used up eliminating feedback or dealing with room modes, that's already been addressed so they can really just take care of the tone of that particular instrument. And so you sort of want to strategize and divide and conquer what you need to accomplish with EQ in this way. Um, there's two kinds of EQ equalizers that you're likely to run into the most. Um, the first one you might have seen is a graphic EQ. It has many bands of EQ adjustment, but the frequencies are fixed. So you can't choose the frequency, or you can't choose a frequency in between two of the bands. You're, you're stuck with the frequencies that are pre-assigned, but you have many, many little bands of control. This is compared to a parametric EQ. Now a parametric EQ usually has fewer bands than a graphic EQ does. Graphic EQs have eight, 16, 24, 32 bands. They've got many bands of EQ. You'll probably have fewer bands of control on a parametric EQ, but you can completely choose which frequency and how wide of a scope uh, that this affects when you're doing your boosting or your, or your cutting. Um, and there are going to be 
about three kinds of EQ adjustments that you're going to run into the most. Uh, there'll be cuts, so you can do a, a, a low cut where you just chop off the low end, and so maybe a, a certain amount uh, on a vocal mic or a violin mic, uh, a certain set of the low frequencies was just going to be rumble and noise getting into the system, so you just cut it off. Um, and focus on the efficiency of the frequency that the uh, that the instrument actually is in. Uh, in fact, uh, I will include a link in the description. There are a lot of charts out there that show the frequency ranges that voices and instruments and things fall into. So you can sort of pay attention to where where the action is. Um, so you'll lose, use low cuts or high cuts to, to get rid of the unwanted frequencies that, that uh, don't come into play with whatever this particular channel is. There's bell curve ones where you can, you know, where you set the frequency and you, you can move them around and you probably run into the bell curve ones quite a lot. Now shelving EQs, uh, and we'll show you, it's where from a certain point, uh, from that point and, and higher on, on a high shelf or from a certain point and lower for a low shelf, you can either boost or cut a whole bunch of frequencies. This is what the tone controls were doing in the, that uh, original example of my parents' console stereo. And you'll see the same thing on lots of car stereos, boom boxes. Uh, but when you see tone controls, they're generally shelving EQs. Um, I'll mention the most exciting new category of EQs that you'll possibly run into in digital boards is uh, active EQs. An active EQ is sort of the handsome child of a compressor and an EQ, whereas you set uh, your EQ points, um, but they're only activated when the signal levels go above a certain threshold. So instead of having a frequency notched out all the time, it only gets pulled out when it's a problem. So active EQs can really be used smartly to um, maintain the integrity of the signal as much as possible and yet still open up the space for the, the instruments to coexist. It can also uh, be used, for instance, to counteract the proximity effect of the microphone. So if, if a singer is a little bit loose in terms of how close or far away from a microphone they get, an active EQ can help keep their, their frequency response to be more normalized uh, between all those positions. And then you, you end up having a, a show that has a just a, a more consistent sort of a delivery to it, which can be lovely. Now, when you're working on EQing things, I'm going to suggest the old school approach, which is to, as often as possible, do EQ cuts before you try and do any uh, boosts. Uh, in a studio situation, you can knock yourself out. You can use the cuts, boosts, whatever you want. In a live sound situation, if you can do it with a cut, I want to start in that direction. First of all, it's normally simpler, um, but knowing that EQ is effectively a frequency specific volume control. If you're doing lots and lots of boosting, you're going to affect the gain staging that you've established for your show. You're going to possibly create a greater opportunity for feedback because of this. And you could possibly um, lose some of your headroom uh, in, your, in your channel and in your buses. Uh, and so if you can do it from cuts, it feels like it's a safer start. Um, as usual, uh, whatever works. If it work, if it sounds good, it is good. So go with whatever works for you. But I try to start on the cuts before I get to the boosts. Um, how about another example of strategizing using the EQ so that you get the best bang for the buck? What if you were doing a musical, you had 30 wireless mics, the microphones all happen to be the same type. Now this is an area where you can use the, the buses or the external, the uh, additional mixes within a mixing board to your advantage. So you route those channels to a mix bus and then that bus will go then to the main output. And that mix bu bus could exist solely so that you could uh, take those microphones, notch out whichever couple of frequencies might want to feed back within the room. And so if you've done a few different notches in there in the group, now you have set yourself up so, such that all the channel EQ can be specific to the individual performers and the characters or instruments uh, because you've already done the housekeeping in a different EQ and then that one single EQ for all 30 wireless mics, uh, that's just effective. That's sort of a, a wonderful way to approach it and that's one of the ways you can accomplish what you need to with EQ. One consideration when you're looking at problem solving EQ strategies is that 
if you, for instance, had problems with 400 hertz uh, on a, in a particular situation, I would also look at 200 and 800 because the predictable laws of physics will let you know that these frequencies that are harmonically related to each other could have relations to how they're causing problems for you. And in fact, that problem you had at 400 could practically vanish if you really pull back enough 200, for instance. Uh, so you have to look at harmonically related frequencies when you're attacking problems like room modes. All right, tangent cam. The best EQ strategy is to not need EQ. If you solo up something on your mixer and it sounds like complete garbage, maybe the mic needs to be placed differently. This will never work. Maybe if you have some options available to you, a different microphone would be preferable. As much as you can get a good capture at the source, it's gonna make your day better in uncountable ways, including not needing to EQ it to make it sound good. It'll come to you good. That's the best EQ strategy. So while this video isn't a in-depth how-to video, it's sort of an overview of how to think about EQ. How to deploy it, how to strategically use it to your benefit, how to make sure that if you solve the bigger problems on the further end from you so that you have a well-tuned sound system, a room where the room modes have been mitigated, and then you have the tone control on your console so when you need to reach for it, it really is available for you. I think this is a great way to approach it. Uh, as Joe Meek said, if it sounds good, it is good. So that's that still is going to be the ultimate goal, is having it sound good. And I'll give the normal reminder that I would for any sound video, there's more than one right answer when it comes to things like EQ but there are some definite wrong answers. So if, uh, if somebody's doing it differently, that's, that's cool. And if it, if it works for you, then that's wonderfully cool. I just hope these are interesting ways to think about EQ in a live sound reinforcement setting.